and peace in our world. And Unity Worldwide recognizes this. The theme for World Day of Prayer is peace in our midst. <clears throat> So I want us to talk about being peace. Now, if you were like me, we are all still in boot camp, moving toward graduation in being peace every part of the day. We sang earlier, I've got peace like a river in my soul. Jesus, our master teacher, exemplified such ever-flowing peace. There's a daily word from, I think, a few months back that applies here. And it began, as an expression of God, I always have access to the divine idea of harmony. Every thought I think and every action I take stems from a choice that I make. Then I printed the rest of it up here so we can all say it together. This is such a beautiful daily word. So let's read together. Harmony is an inner decision that I make. beautiful. Today I give myself the gift of peace. So Emily Cady, we've quoted Charles already this morning, so we're going to pull from some more oldies. She says this, we talk to God, that is prayer. God talks to us, that is inspiration. We go apart to get still, that new life New inspiration, new power of thought, new supply from the fountainhead may flow in, and then we come forth to shed it on all those around us, that they too may be lifted up. Then we're not going to read this one, but, the next, but I'm just going to read it and you can see it also. In harmony cannot remain in any home where even one member of the family daily practices this hour of the presence of God, so surely does the renewed infeeling of the heart by peace and harmony result in the continuing outgoing of peace and harmony into the entire surroundings. Peace begins one person at a time, one consciousness at a time. That's the core of it all. Peace is a consciousness issue. So I'm going to share with you a true story from the Nazi occupation in Denmark during World War II. And this story was so powerful that it impacted a town in Montana in 1993 after a large number of skinheads moved into town. So it um, not only changed the immediate circumstances there, but it so inspired another woman. So we're going to talk about these two stories. So Hitler had ordered the king of Denmark to force all the Danish Jews to wear the Star of David on their chests. And he simply refused. In an act of courageous defiance, the king placed the yellow star over his own heart, declaring that he and all his people were one. 
that if Hitler wanted to persecute the Jews, he would have to take the king as well. But the king was not to stand alone. His example inspired people of all religions to wear stars in their solidarity with the Jews. And because of their courage, the Nazis were unable to find their enemies. In Denmark, there were no Jews, no Gentiles, only Danes. So now for the Mo Montana part of the story. And Valerie Kay, who's been here recently, um, I was sharing this in um, Unity of Bonaire, and she said, oh, she's, her mom was in Montana, she said, I was there when this happened. So um, in Billings, Montana, Tammy help, helped her son make a stencil of a menorah to put on the window to celebrate Hanukkah. And shortly after they had finished this and taped it up, a brick flew through the window, shattering the glass. And the next day, the Billings Gazette described the event. And the mother was troubled by the investigating officer's advice. You'd better remove the symbol from your home. And she said to him, how can you explain that kind of hatred to her young son? So another mother in the community named Margaret didn't want Isaac to remember the season of love with hatred and fear. So she called her pastor and asked if he would tell that Danish story during church and pass out paper menorahs so families could hang them in their windows. And her pastor called other pastors, and that Sunday people all over town were hanging up menorahs in their windows. Businesses and other um, things in the community joined in. In the sporting goods store hung up a sign that said, not in our town, no hate, no violence, peace on earth. Well, this didn't quite stop the hate-filled people. High school windows were smashed. Church windows were broken. Six non-Jewish families had car windows broken. But not to be dismayed, the Billings Gazette published a full-page drawing of a menorah and invited its readers to post it in a town with 100 Jewish families, thousands of menorahs were displayed. The violence decreased. The violence intended to rip the town apart only served to make it stronger, to make it more united. Violence was overcome with love. Peace won. I invite us to notice that it began with one person's consciousness and a whole town responded. So now I want to hear want you to hear a story from Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Then Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping and the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why 
are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So let's identify what the people and things represent. So Jesus is our own Christ consciousness. The disciples' voices in our head that keep bringing up things from the past and our fears. The wind, thunder, lightning, and rain, the outer things that pull our attention away from the truth of who we really are. Well, we all have our own storms. They can involve family behaviors, workplace situations, financial situations, school events. We've had some, some serious weather storms lately. You name it, we can find a storm. So this story invites us to ask, how do the voices in our head keep us in lack consciousness or noise consciousness? Voices that say, there isn't enough. There's no way out of this. I will never get the job I want. My coworker is so dishonest and cantankerous, I can't take one more minute. On and on and on these voices go. So I want us to ask the question, what effect were the disciples' voices having on each other? Well, we don't really get this dialogue in the story, but we can make it up. <laughs> and I'm sure it was happening. I say it was stirring up more fear. They believed that something outside was more powerful than the power within themselves. We've all been there. Someone says, you will never succeed at that. How do you think you can make a living doing art or music or fill in the blank? You will never get that debt paid off. Already there is a part of us that is afraid this is true, and hearing another say it makes it seem more real. We begin to start believing it in earnest. So the key question is, how did Jesus create peace? And this is my take. He already had the assurance that within himself there was nothing in the outer world that was more powerful than the divinity within himself. He just tapped into that and said, there is nothing to fear. In the Markin account, which we read the Matthew account, he declares to the um, waves and the wind, peace, be still. He rebuked the voices that were caught up in fear. He rebuked the disciples. He did not give the outer circumstances any power. Outer circumstances can take us down in the blink of an eye. They seem like killer waves, and they throw us off balance. But Christ consciousness does not give them any power. So the trick is to catch ourselves and remember what is true. And I think I've told you before, when you get in such a space that you absolutely can't do that, you do the phone a friend trick, right? You get them to help you remember what is true. 
The power within is stronger than any power outside of us. Even when we can see no answer, spirit has unlimited possibilities. Possibilities we haven't even imagined. Here's our buddy Gandhi. Our words can create peace or they can create chaos just like our thoughts. And Arun Gandhi, who is a grandson, tells this story about his grandfather and a man named Soren. And this is another story that almost makes me weep. It's so beautiful. So Soren's wife, son, and daughter were raped and murdered by a hate-filled crowd of Muslims. He was a Hindu. So what came to him was to be in retaliation. So he joined a violent Hindu mob, and before he knew it, he himself was involved in the massacre of a Muslim family. And once that was over, the truth of what he had done went to the core of his being. And he knew he would be haunted forever. And he thought the only person who could help him was Mahatma Gandhi. So he sought him out, and with tears streaming down his face, he sought counsel from this great man. And right at this point, Gandhi was fasting against the violence in his own country. He was in a very weak state. Things had gotten kind of out of control. And that was Gandhi's way of saying, I'm going to do something about this, and if you want me to stop, You'll stop the violence. So he could barely speak. So he whispered to this man, go and work for peace and harmony and find an orphaned Muslim baby and adopt it as your own and raise it in its own faith. We are one human race, and religion must unify and not divide us. So Soren followed Gandhi's advice. Peace came after word spread of Gandhi's fast, and he ceased fasting. And Soren found a young Muslim mother with an infant baby. Her husband and family had been killed. She had been raped, and now she was an outcast. One moment of madness had changed her life, just as it had changed Soren's. A relationship developed and he not only adopted her boy, but had a child with her after marriage. So through these stories and through our own lives, we really see that peace begins in our consciousness, in our thinking, and it flows into the world changing one life at a time. Next one. So what does it require? It requires this hard thing of giving up being right. Certainly, Soren was right to be angry. It wasn't such a good idea to take that anger and put action to it. 
it requires forgiveness. I was just listening. I don't know. Have you all, are you all familiar with Charlie Tweet? He's a musician that travels around, and he's uh, from a course, highly steeped in a course in miracles. And he has a song that says, "Every moment is an opportunity for forgiveness." I think there's some truth in that. And it requires letting go and being in the present moment. Because the stuff we hold on to so dearly, it's stuff from the past. And then being ready to express the divine love that we are, that's tied with being in the present moment. My friends, it begins in stillness and in prayer. So I want us to close with a small part of the song we, re we sang earlier. And um, so you kind of know the tune. So we're going to sing this through two times, just this very brief portion of it. <sighs> and Chris is going to help us get rolling here. <clears throat> divine love expressing in all its radiance and joy. And so it is. Yes.